Okay. It's a terrible thing to be confused inside ourselves. To have to make wrenching, doubtful decisions, maybe 50 or 60 during the day, not knowing whether they're right or wrong, not knowing what their consequence will be, not knowing whether they're going to get us into worse trouble than we are now. So confusion, simply stated, is a dreadful way to live. You can either find your way out of confusion or you can cover it up so expertly, so perfectly from yourself that all it will do is tear you apart at the same time you're claiming that you're Or we can cover up our confusion by trying to achieve something, by do, doing something exciting, by living in daydreams, by coming to spiritual classes and sitting asleep right in the middle of the classes and go out with nothing valuable to take with us because we haven't really been, been listening, because we've covered it up right in here, our confusion up here. Our talk tonight really is not on that subject, but apply it to what we're going to talk about, the idea of confusion. We're going to talk about something we haven't gone into ever before in the group, which is the relationship between the teacher of the class and between the class itself, interrelationship between the two. It should be obvious from the start that there has to be a good relationship, a right one. Otherwise, there can be no learning. There's an atmosphere of general confusion, of fear, of resistance, of daydreaming again, of going into imagination. Learning can't take place. It's part of the task of the teacher. We'll go back and forth on my responsibility and on your responsibility as we talk. It's the responsibility of the teacher to make sure that the atmosphere remains right at all times. The physical atmosphere is right, that there's not confusion in the class, that if someone comes in late, that that is simply taken care of without going into deeper confusion. To keep in command of things, to not permit anyone in the room to take over the class, to blab on and on, for example, in their sleep. So we have a two-way responsibility. Yours to listen and to get yourself out of the way, mine or any other teacher, to see that he's not bluffing about anything, not trying to impress the student, but giving to the student what he has learned, which is the only thing he has to give to them. While you in turn give your attention, and I'll even use a word I don't think we've ever used, and I use it for the first time to give your respect to the teacher by having a proper attitude toward it. Any ego competition between the teacher and the student in the smallest way will obviously ruin any communication between us. And you watch, you watch even tonight to see if there's any ego competition or to see that you may have had it all along and not been aware of it because the attitudes that you have out in the world, if you have ego competition out there, vanity competition out there, in your work, in your home, you want to dominate somebody in the home. 
without knowing it, you will bring that right into this class. And because it's a mechanical thing, an unconscious thing, you could project it right in this room, perhaps toward the teacher or toward someone else. And so everything is lost. What do you think would be, I'm going to ask you now, what do you think, thinking for yourself now, would be a proper attitude for you to have, just generally speaking, in the class toward me as your teacher and toward yourself? Do you have any ideas on that? Is anything aroused in your mind? Right? Let's take one. You know, any time I look for the perfect student, we won't have a class at all. Any time you look for the perfect teacher, we're not going to have a class at all. So a simple patience with each other. You look at me, and I look at you, and any any pettiness, you listen to that word pettiness, any pettiness that you have toward me or I toward you or you toward anyone else, toward anyone in this class, any small pettiness, any small criticism will instantly cut off our learning together. Oh, he always says the same thing. I know exactly how he's going to conclude that sentence. Is that what you're paying attention to? Or I look at you and I know how you're going to talk, how you're going to respond, what you're going to say when you're up here giving your talks. And if I am critical of that, can I learn anything from you? Or can I learn anything about myself as long as I'm criticizing, as long as I have the need to feel superior to you? You search very, very carefully, and don't think you've already done it. You start afresh on it to see what attitude you have in this room toward me and toward the person sitting next to you and toward the person across the room. Look, we're all in a very special situation in this class, a very special atmosphere. And if any of us have one ounce of brains, we will make the most of it. We'll come here with the intention to put this familiar arrow that we've talked so much about back on ourselves to see how we are responding to everything that's happening in here. I'll give you, and I'll even ask you a question now. Have you been aware up to this point, I've been talking about 10 minutes now, of how you've responded up to this point? Have you turned the arrow back and seen your own mind saying certain things? This is, this is what it's all about. This is what self-knowledge, what self-observation, what self-learning is all about. To see, to see what is happening to you, to me, right now be quite aware of it. You might be quite surprised at some of the things you see going through your mind, things that have nothing whatever to do with our purpose in being here, which is to find out what life is all about and to get rid of the confusion, to get rid of the petty irritations, and hopefully to get through with repeating what happened today, repeating it tomorrow. To put an end to putting into motion the causes that made today what it was. You're in a particular situation, maybe at work or something, and you see yourself running a mental movie through your mind of how you're going to speak to someone else. Maybe you caught them in a mistake or something, or you caught them in some kind of a, a, a dumb action, to put it bluntly. 
and you're going to speak to them about it. You watch your mind very carefully, and you will find that you're getting a great thrill out of bawling them out. You're getting a sense, as we've talked about so much, a sense of I out of it. And if you're watching yourself very carefully, as you should be doing right now, you will find that you're a very, very harsh, cruel person who could have, had he watched himself, said something like this, you know, all my life, either in my daydreams or actually out in life, I've taken every opportunity I can to pounce on people, to bawl them out, to speak sternly with them, because I get a sense of, of power out of it. I get a sense of, of, uh, of being right about it. You're watching yourself run through your mind how you're going to behave toward this person, harshly bawl them out. Whatever. And you may be suddenly shocked to see how cruel You've always been all your life uselessly cruel because it did nothing for you. And for the first time, for the first time, you may see what it actually means to be kindly toward another human being. Kindly because you have at last seen your confusion in falsely trying to get something out of the situation bawling the other person out, which is illegitimate, which is wrong, which is cruel, because it destroys you and puts them under fear. I've asked you one time, in fact, I've asked you many times, how many of you, well, I'll try it again right now, how many of you within the last week since we met here last have put any other human being under fear? No one? You have put anyone under fear? I'm not talking about yelling at them. I'm talking about that facial expression. I'm talking about that attitude. I'm talking about just, just the way you behave in a room full of other people or with another person, harsh with them, that puts them under fear. Your responsibilities in this class is to listen right in the middle of your confusion. Be how, how can you do otherwise? At the same time, trying to see that the confusion is simply, listen, the confusion is simply and wholly and totally what you have been all your life. And this you who has been this all your life can't do a thing about it. But if you were to listen carefully, you would learn that there's another part of you that can be developed through learning the lessons in this class. They can, be, can begin to put an end to the rebellious part, the angry part, the part, the part in every one of us that wants nothing to do with self-transformation, with truth at all. So by coming here with the right attitude, we can change everything. So your responsibility is to have observation of yourself here now to see where you bite, have wrong attitudes seated in this class right now. Not necessarily toward me, because the same attitudes, wrong attitude you might have toward me will be exactly the same that you have toward yourself. Correct? You remember we learned that any negative spirit that we have, first of all, burns me because that is me. Then I project that negative spirit out toward anyone else, especially anyone who threatens my vanity, my ego images that I have of myself. I send those out and become angry with that person and thereby burn myself. You are all students in this class now, and someday 
if you continue to work real hard on yourselves, you will be a teacher of the class, maybe, maybe. You're beginning to get your feet wet, so to speak, with these talks on Sunday. But for now, I want to tell you something. I want to tell you that in your present role, right role, necessary role as a student, you do not understand the responsibilities of a teacher. Because as a student, you are passive, correct? As students here, right now, you're sitting back, looking at me, listening to what I'm saying, having certain reactions to it. You are all, right now, in a passive role. This is very easy. Nothing is easier than being passive in this class. If you want to break out, if you want to find yourself you cannot always remain passive toward the teacher. If you want to grow, you must eventually get to the point where you, quite consciously, and being conscious that you may be bluffing 99% of the time, is all right, as long as you see it, you must get to the point where you start to teach others, even if it's nothing more than during the break saying one sentence to someone else as an exercise which helped them and also helps you because you're stating the truth that helps both of you. You have to, all of you, if you want to really grow, change from being passive to being active. And you can start with what we're doing on Sunday, but it can go and must go much farther than that if you want to learn more. Otherwise, you will only have the one side of the opposites of the pendulum, which is the passive side, which also can include an enormous amount of laziness, an enormous amount of wanting to sit back and being told what to do without finding out for yourself, which is the hard part of it, in nodding your head when I say something that you agree with, the question is, do you actually live what you nodded your head to, or is it intellectual knowledge only? As you advance and begin to teach others in a small way or in a large way, you will have n new responsibilities, you will have heavy responsibilities toward yourself and equally toward the other person that in your present state as passive listeners you have no idea about at all. The point being, there are a thousand things ahead of us that we know not of. We know a few things in back, do we not? We know, for example, there was a time when we'd never in the world been interested in a class like this. Because we had it made, didn't we? With our money, our life, whatever it was, exciting life. We saw the folly of that. That is in back of us. So the assumptions, the assumptions that all you have to do is come here and listen is a wrong assumption, which will keep you a listener, which will keep you a listener to someone else instead of raising yourself to the capacity where you can listen to yourself all day long and be right. Wouldn't that be nice, to be able to listen to yourself and know you're right, not out of vanity or imagination, but because you know, because wholeness knows itself. Now you won't have to run to anyone on the telephone. You won't have to run to the book even. You will know. Because you once heard a talk which said that you have to become, start with being passive and then pass over to being active. Because when you teach others, you're also teaching yourself. And when you teach others, then you qualify yourself, teach yourself you're qualified to teach others. which is a great leap. How many here do you suppose uh, will remain active, uh, passive all your life? 
Just think about it. I'm asking you to think about it. You don't have to answer the question. If you remain passive, you won't learn, you won't grow, you won't get out of this confusion that we're talking about. Do you know how you can grow in this class and become, become active, more active? By following the very small assignments that the active teacher gives you so that you're responding to his active commands. If you're asked to give a short talk, to volunteer to give a short talk, give a short talk. If you're asked to come regularly to these meetings instead of coming once a month or whenever you feel about it, feel like it, come regularly. If I ask you to be on time, please be on time. You know, there are definite rules on every level which are given to you to follow, which in themselves will help you to become active. To put that in a totally different way, it will help you to be in command of yourself all day long, all night long. Is that what we're after? Or are we after sitting here in this class and simply listening to a talk? I wonder I really do. I, I really wonder how many of you understand in even a small way that the purpose of every one of us, myself included, the purpose of us being in this room tonight and on other days is to transform ourselves inwardly, to become a new kind of person to no longer be angry about anything. How's that? To no longer be angry about anything. Not, not because you've successfully suppressed it and lied about it and hidden it from yourself. But to not to be angry anymore because there's no center in you that has the capacity, if you can call it that, the capacity to be angry. I wonder if you realize that this is the goal that you must set for your life. Your life. I therefore wonder if you understand how much more energy you're going to have to put into seeing more fully than you do now that the ways you have acted and thought and felt and responded up to this point have done nothing for you at all. How about putting more energy into seeing that point alone? That to live fearfully, which you all do now, that to live fearfully does nothing for you except to create suffering. Afraid of breaking out of your petty little life that you have now because it has a certain degree of comfort to it? Okay. Take the comfort and live in hell for the rest of your life. Hide yourself and your money and your career and your friends in your daydreams, in your pretenses. Or take a long leap by breaking outside of yourself, by being a better student here on Friday and Saturday and Sunday, and by taking the responsibility for yourself when you leave here tonight of discovering what it means to be a better student. I wonder, I wonder if any of you will do that much to make the effort, would you have time, not while you're driving, the traffic is thick. When you get home and you have a little time, you sit down with a paper and pencil and ask, thinking for myself now, what does it mean to be a better student? 
more valuable to myself, more valuable to everyone else, and more valuable to the teacher. Don't you understand that you're more valuable to me as you become valuable to yourself? Because truth is one thing, consciousness is one thing. You find out, you find out where you are failing because you're asleep, which you are, where you're failing to use this class for maximum benefit. And you do that when you get home. This is your responsibility. And if you consider yourself weak, which you do, if you know you are weak, have some awareness of your weakness, which you do, you will also have idols, saviors, someone to look up to, idols, and you won't know you're doing it. I will guarantee you that, because all idol worship, whether it's another human being or some god that you read about in a book, you'll be quite unconscious of what you're doing because you've identified with that role of being someone who is safe in the hands of this someone else, whether it's a religious figure of thousands of years ago or a politician of today or your strong father who isn't strong at all or your wise mother who isn't wise at all or whoever. The point being this, until you can watch the movement of your own mind and your own total system closely enough to see that you are depending on someone else, not necessarily for their advice, they could be a million miles away, but you're depending upon someone else to give you a feeling of security. Well, all is well because my husband is here. All is well because this politi uh, political figure is the one who is elected. All is well because my boss uh, apparently likes me and won't fire me. Wherever you're getting a feeling of security from anyone else, it would also be a false sense of security operating in your own mind. And if you don't believe it, you just wait till your idol falls, till something changes, till your own daydreams are challenged very abruptly so that you're sent into despair as to who you're going to turn to next. Try sometime not turning to anyone next, not to any book next. And this class will teach you to do that. Okay, we're open discussion now. Do you have any comments or questions? Yes, Jean. Why do you say not to any book? So that you don't become eternally dependent on it. Get the knowledge from it. And then sometime, when you're tempted to turn to the book, which is right on its own level, as students, we need to read books, sometime, instead of reading the book, turn to yourself. And I'm not saying that uh, as a figure of speech or be clever with words, but you turn and try to read yourself instead of the book. And you find the answer there. Don't you understand? I'll tell you, you think of every book that you believe is true, any book at all that you think is a true book, you have that same thing right in you. You have all that knowledge inside of you. You actually do. I'm not lying to you. I'm telling you, I know you do. I know this. But you haven't found it yet, which is the purpose of this class, 
to help you to read yourself. We're reading ourselves, but it's, what's the word, gobbledygook? It doesn't make sense to us. When you read yourself now, it's a foreign language, isn't it? It's not understandable at all. You look at your confusion, what's that? The time will come when you will understand your confusion instead of looking at it. And when you understand it, it won't be there because you will not continue to run it through your mind. There'll be no need to run it through your mind because it's not valuable to you anymore. Because you've had the courage, I've said this before, you've had the courage, listen to this, the courage to drop your confusion. And if you have it, you love it. If you have agitation in your mind, in your feelings, you love it. It's given you a, this is your false love, which will betray you all the time. Confusion courses through us simply because we're unwilling to give up who we are today who we've called ourselves today and yesterday and yesterday and yesterday. You want to be somebody. You know that? You still want to be somebody, don't you? You even want to be somebody who knows the truth and and are free. That is imagination. Remember we said if you stopped, if you stopped seeking the truth, you would not find it, you would be it. Because a student, on its, his own level, must seek the truth. But he must come to the point where, see, there's nothing to seek. What is there to seek? When you seek, what are you trying to find? Something that will fulfill your image of, ah, at last I've got it. If you say, if that's your imagination, you'll never get it. Because you still want the thrill, the relief of saying and imagining, now I've got it, or then I'll have it. On the level of words, it's quite proper and quite necessary. As long as you're imagining how you will be, you will never be anything but who you now are. Because you're keeping the mechanical force going Uh, over here, please, then, Dorothy. Yes. Well, I was thinking... Loud and clear, please. Uh, if you don't have the knowledge, you don't have the tools to work with. Yes, we're getting tools to work with with knowledge here. But I remember last May when I came here first, I couldn't even understand it because I didn't know what the words meant. Is it clearer now? Yes, ma'am. Well, then it, is it this seeking, this trying to get something that makes us suffer so much in our relationships with every other human being, mm-hmm. every other human mm-hmm. being? You're seeking an answer, are you not? Now, l- now, listen to this. You've heard this before. Who is seeking? You are seeking, you're seeking something else, aren't you? What is this else you're seeking? Do you know? Yes, you do, but it's a false knowing. You understand? You know what you're seeking. You're seeking the truth that will set you free. All right, describe it to me. You can't because you don't know. These are words. I'm seeking the truth that sets me free. All right. If you know you're saying that, if you're using words consciously, fine. But if you're using it as a hope, if you're using it to impress someone else, you're running the mechanical force through your mind. Nothing can happen. Nothing can happen. Who's the seeker? Who's, who is the desperate seeker who wants out of this hell you're living in? Who? It's a mechanical thing in itself. When you see this, when you see that you, if, if you seek, you keep the desperate seeking going, I don't care what you seek, 
whether it's religion or power or whatever, as long as you're seeking it, the seeking is part of the sought. It's an imagination, is it not? Give up the you who wants to seek and see what happens. We have to seek in order to see that seeking is useless. See, now we've got the opposite in there, haven't we? Of course we're seeking, but I just said that consciously. I know I said it. See? The student, the student is simply someone who doesn't understand that he doesn't have, he wouldn't have to be a student if he could see it all at once. When we're, when we're still asleep, we have to be students. We call it being a student. You get pride out of being a student. You get hope out of being a student. If you can see something, that's different. See, If you can see that you come here for the purpose of putting an end to the squirrel cage, of trying to get rid of your problems by distractions, by saying, God will help me, or whatever. If we can see the folly of what we're trying to do, then we stop doing it, then something else happens. Then I don't seek anymore, but I am it. One of the most astonishing things that comes to us as we seek is to see that what the truth is is totally different from what we thought it would be than what we imagined it would be because it's not like what we in our conditioning think it will be it's not at all it's a it's a nothingness which is everything which is why we say so much in this class about imagining. And while you're imagining, of course, when you're imagining something, do you know you're imagining at the time you're imagining it? Not at all. There's nothing besides the imagination. When you cease the imagination of being the big hero, when you cease picturing yourself in your mind of hitting the home run or being the hit of the party, if you cease imagining that, then you remember yourself imagining it, you see? But at the moment, you couldn't see yourself imagining. So we're in our imagination, remember this is the whole business. This is what I am, which is why we're trying to remember ourselves, why we're trying to interrupt ourselves, to interrupt this, this uh, movie scene where I'm the hero or you're the heroine, right in the middle of it so we can say, hey, one second ago I was imagining I was a hero. Now we're seeing something different from what we were before, which is the beginning of putting an end to it. Are you willing to leave a blank space inside of you that has no emotion or imagination or hope or no anger to it or no envy to it or no yearning to it or no wish that something would turn out the way you want it. Can you leave a blank space there and not hope for a thing? No movement at all. Not wanting anything. You do that and see what happens to you your whole life. See how you talk. You talk in a different way to people. The salesman who comes to your door. To your relatives. You talk different because you are different. You watch how you know and understand what to do if an outside crisis difficulty comes up. You will know what to do because you will understand the difference between self-defeating and self-advancing behavior. You'll know the difference. And self-advancing behavior, to use that phrase, has no confusion in it at all. You know, and you know right now without thinking about it. Correct? Without 
thinking about it. Because if you think about it, you're going to wobble back and forth. Yes, no, go, stay, good, bad. We're above that now. We see, we understand. There's no me here to divide it into my benefit if I do this or my harm if I do that. There's no one there to be concerned with what happens and that no one there is rightness itself. It's not my rightness, it's not yours or yours. It is our rightness as part of the cosmic whole. This is, this is totally, listen, this is totally effortless living. No problems at all. Or are you in love with your problems? You still have a need to hate someone or dislike someone for how they behave toward you? That's your problem. That's your agitation. And that's certainly not truth expressing itself inside you. But that's just the way the world lives. We're trying to get out of it here in this class. Comments, questions? I sometimes wonder why we or I can be so tired of all of this, meaning the the swing back and forth of the pendulum, the yes, no, the trying to get something, the senseless relationships, and yet still do it, still mm -hmm. stay in it. It's, there are things in it that, that we're getting that we don't want to see yet. You don't want to be nothing. Yeah. You want to be someone, Dorothy. Mm -hmm. <laughs> That's right. You want to be someone. You want to be a sufferer. <laughs> you want to cry. I've told you, have the courage to stop bawling. And you'll bawl tomorrow because you love it. That's you. You have to give up you to stop bawling. Are you willing? Or do you love your tears? Or do you love your authority over other people? Your cruel authority over other people. You love being someone in relation to another person. You find out what mental pictures you have of yourself in relation to who? Your wife, husband, boss, children, parents. You watch how you play different roles in order to be a different person, to please them or whatever. You watch how you have your standard set of roles for behaving towards certain people. Some of you have certain roles for talking to, to me. I've seen them very clearly. You're usually very respectful toward me. <laughs> Which you should be consciously. And all of you, every one of you in this room, you are afraid of me without exception, every one of you. That's right. Which is a wrong emotion, a wrong attitude. How can you learn from someone that you're afraid of? This means that also, partly, you have a false idolization of me. You don't want to offend someone who could help you get out of your mess. This also means that you could turn against me mentally, mostly, if you're afraid of me. Do you understand that? You could turn against me, and you have. I know you have in your mind. What a waste of energy.
write down a sentence, please. Everyone suffers enough without my neurosis adding to it. Everyone suffers enough without my neurosis adding to it. Take that home with you. And a second sentence in a moment. There is great pain in compulsive duties and compulsive virtues. There is great pain in compulsive duties and compulsive virtues. talking with many of you, it's become quite evident that you don't see clearly what it means to live in compulsive duties and compulsive virtues. Compulsive duty to, listen to this, to explain yourself to other people, to explain why you do a certain thing why you behave a certain way or don't behave a certain way. You feel that you owe an explanation to another person for your behavior which you don't accept on the simple everyday level. You spill your coffee on someone, you say, I'm sorry, I spilled my coffee on you, can I help you clean it up? A simple thing like that is not what we're talking about. We're talking about you not knowing, not understanding that your life is your life and doesn't belong to anyone else at all. But because we're still depending on other people, uh, idol worship, things we talked about last night, or we think that someone else can be strength for us, or we're simply afraid of offending them because they'd be angry with us, we entered into endless forced compulsive duties. How many of you write letters that you wish you didn't have to write because you think it's compelled of you? How many of you make phone calls that you wish you didn't have to make, but you think the other person expects it? Or maybe it's a part of your whole system of faults and compulsive duties. You know, when we're free inwardly, then we can do anything we want or not do anything we want without any sense of compulsion or pain or division or fear in it. We do it simply because it's natural with us. How about a compulsory virtue? I was watching all of you this morning and saw examples of compulsive virtues. One, do you think it's necessary to listen, listen? Do you think it's necessary to appear cheerful here? Some of you come in here, not all of you, you have your own particular type of neurosis. Some of you come here thinking that it's necessary for you to be bouncy and cheerful when you walk into here, that it's required of you. What a strain. And aren't you glad when you can sit down and drink your coffee and forget all about it? All these compulsive things that are forced on us are forced on us never, never, never by any other human being, but only by our own misunderstanding of what we must do. You search into this and you'll be astonished and maybe shocked at how many things you're doing simply because you think you have to do them for maybe 50 wrong reasons. For example, you must, you must do something profitable with your time.
We feel a boredom with our usual everyday activities. Our lives feel empty. And in that state, we are very receptive to the call of compulsive actions, of useless actions, of escaping actions. And so we go out and join that dumb club or start that dumb business or get involved in that stupid involvement. All because we, listen, because we feel that we must do this in order, for heaven's sake, to give life, quote marks, meaning. Right? In order to give life purpose. I vow to you, unless we're running around idiotically blabbing, doing something, unless we're doing this, we feel as if our lives are being wasted. We're wasting our lives feeling that this is the only thing we can do is to get involved in these dumb things. I've asked you a question one time. I'll repeat it. You personalize this now. Have you ever been in a place, a party, or someone invited you over, a neighbor invited you over to dinner, or you went someplace, you went to a movie, you did anything, and all of a sudden you got an accidental shock. You're not capable of shocking yourself yet. But an accidental shock happened, and you suddenly said to yourself, what on earth am I doing here? How did I get involved in this? In the first? I don't want to be here blabbing with you about your hometown in Indiana. I want to live my own life. How did I get involved in this? This is beautiful self-awakening and the beginning of seeing that our whole lives are compulsive and mechanical, that we don't live our own lives at all, but to live a life of nonsense composed of my nonsense and your nonsense getting together. The point is, begin to catch yourself planning something. Catch yourself right in the middle of something you've already planned, and you find out whether you are genuinely at ease in that situation or whether you are demanding that it give you something that will make you feel that you have a purpose, make you feel right, make you feel excited. Right in the middle of that excitement, you will not see it because you are the excitement itself. But see if you can practice these things you've talked about, self-interruption, to see that you're doing something because you don't know anything else to do with your life, which is wearing you out and costing you a lot of money, if uh, that's of interest to you. You're wasting your money. When you could be, when you could be living your own life, really doing what you want to do, that is quite natural and quite spontaneous. And, and it could be a thousand things. Life is very generous with us on the everyday level. We can find endless things to do that I want to do or that you want to do on the everyday level, which are not necessarily the same things. You might enjoy picnicking. I don't. I might enjoy something that you don't. This is individuality expressing itself quite naturally which you will find and which you will live only when the compulsiveness is out of the way. Again, how many of you are now involved in a human relationship which you wonder how on earth you got into it in the first place and how you can get out of it without causing trouble? Trouble to yourself, of course. You don't care about the other person. Trouble, what you call trouble to yourself. Maybe this other person will think less of you or what on earth will you do after you've got out of this? Where are you going to go from here? If you can begin to see that you are thinking unnecessary thoughts almost 99% of the time. The only necessary thoughts we ever think are everyday level ones. I've got to get the trash out in time for the trash man to pick it up on Tuesday or repair the roof or whatever we can begin to see how our own minds operate, we'll, we'll be able to see how they drag us 
into unnecessary involvements, unnecessary what we call excitements, which afterward leave us empty. We don't want to be compulsive about anything. We want to be quiet. We want to be spontaneous. We want to be at ease with ourselves. We want to be at ease. We want to be at ease with ourselves in whatever situation we find ourselves. And if we can begin to watch how we feel in any situation, we can begin to escape that because the physical body will begin to obey the commands of your mind, your clarified mind, and your physical body may demand that you go out and play baseball, and all of a sudden, astonishingly, you discover that you're not interested in playing baseball at all. But it's expected, yeah, we need a shortstop. If you don't come and play shortstop, we won't have a team. Let them solve their problem and let you take that phrase as the golden phrase of the morning. I'm going to say it, and you won't, you won't even see the depths of it, but I'm going to say it anyway, and you begin to see the depths of it. Effective as of almost a quarter after nine on this Saturday morning, you are going to let, except for small children, obviously, except for children, you're going to let every human being that you are in contact with solve their own problems. You're going to force them by getting out of their life, at least mentally, to make their own decisions. You're not going to carry them on your back anymore. And you quit demanding that they carry you, because the two will always be connected. This is what we've often called compromise with other people. You know, there's something in you that, is, that has wanted all your life to live this way. But then you go into the false reactions of guilt. Well, what do I owe them? How many times have you been told what you owe any other human being? You owe them one thing, which is your sanity, which you don't have yet. Find your sanity, that's what you owe. Then you'll know what you owe people on the everyday level, such as good manners, honesty in business, or whatever. compromise and say, if I help you, maybe you'll help me a little bit more than what I help you. Do you know that this is the thought of every, every situation which is called social cooperation? If I give a little something of my time, for example, to that club, maybe I will get a little bit more than I get out of it which is false because there's nothing to get out of it at all except neurosis and identification and the wearing out of your psychic system <clears throat> and the wasting of your money and the building of your fear and your tenseness and nervousness lest reality should take your mask away from you. Can you come to a halt just come to a halt in your life and say to yourself, good heavens, what am I actually doing with myself in relation to other people for now? What am I actually doing to myself because my mind is operating in a certain way? Because I think I owe them something and think they owe me something. How about starting with the step of ceasing to give other people advice of any kind at all unless they ask for it and then answer briefly and watch why you answer the way you do by the way don't give people advice at all they're just draining you and they're not going to listen to your advice anyway they're not capable of it and this, there's one small part of them that wants out of their mess, which is very rare. Don't you anymore, effective as of now, explain yourself, explain your actions to anyone. 
You explain them to yourself. That's what to do. You explain your behavior to yourself to see whether it's sick, to see whether, whether it's fearful, whether it's antagonistic, to see whether it's jealous, to see whether it's grasping. You explain your inner behavior, which will then extend itself outwardly to yourself, which is nothing more than that very valuable teaching that we must know ourselves, must understand ourselves, that we must acquire self-knowledge. Not knowledge of how good we are, but knowledge of how we actually operate without putting a label of any kind on it. This is how, how you become to know yourself by watching yourself without calling it good or bad behavior. Just see what, what, your, what your authentic motive is for doing something, for giving that gift, for blowing up. What was your real motive? Your one motive for blowing up, as we've discovered here in this class, is the false pleasure of blowing up. Because when you blow up for a minute, you block out the fact that you're a person who blows up because <coughs> you don't see it when you're doing it. You're just enjoying it. False enjoyment, destructive enjoyment. <coughs> You find some little place, take pa paper and pencil when you get home, and write down, I will not explain myself, just as the general thought. It's not very specific, but put, I will not explain myself, period. Now that'll remind you of how to begin to think properly toward this topic of not explaining yourself. It can be endless things. I'll give you an example. This morning when I came in, I had a, a bag in my hand, and I noticed Joan looking at it, and I said to myself, I'm not going to explain to Joan, I'm not going to satisfy her curiosity by telling her what's in the bag, which I did. See, I, I succeeded. You find some little place where someone expects you to behave or say a certain thing, don't do it, at the same time being very conscious of the whole thing, of their disappointment, they're sitting in their tents waiting for your explanation and you don't give it, watch their tension and your tension and endure it unto the end and you shall be saved. Right, Rod? He that endureth unto the end shall be saved. Take it as a little thing like this, because you don't understand the big saying. Enduring, enduring our own discomfort of the displeasure, of the disapproval, of the shock, of the hurt. Can you properly be, be, can you properly endure, bear the hurt of another person when you start to behave rightly? You know you're going to shock the life out of them and disappoint them when you start to become true? They can't bear it. They want you to stay as you've always been, which is the way they are, so that the neurosis will have company. Can you, as someone who wants out, begin to bear their hurt and not feel guilty about it? You're not causing it at all. They are causing it, and that is their responsibility, not yours. And you can begin to break away from people, no longer nod your head in agreement, when they make their nonsensical statements, you're going to cause a disturbance in both yourself and in them. Congratulations. You're beginning to break the mechanical habit of being a nice girl, a nice boy, a nice man, a likable fellow, and sick and tired of trying to live up to the image of being nice. Correct? Now don't go back to sleep when you leave here today. You will, but break it. <clears throat> these teachings, I think you will all, in fact, I know you will all agree with this. These teachings are one 
hundred percent different from what we thought they would be when we first walked into this room, correct? And aren't you delighted? Shocked and then delighted. If you're delighted first, it's all wrong. That means that you have misinterpreted and said that man said you can be free and have real power. Ah, power to win. You're delighted. See? The wrong move. If you're shocked first, the teachings say that I am in I have false power in dominating other people and that I shouldn't try to dominate other people because that makes them sick and me sick. If you're shocked first, that's good. That's good, and if you can especially see the greatness of the shock, that's better. If you're disturbed when you walk out of here for the first time, you're, you come in the right spirit, that much anyway. Now come back and be shocked more and more. Or go back to your jungle, either one. Do you know something? You've seen this happen right in this class. Whenever new people come, especially with new people, I try to drop in something. And I make the point, dear sir or madam, you have heard the truth here, perhaps for the first time in your life, maybe. And the greatest decision you'll ever make in your life is whether you want to continue with hearing these truthful things or whether you want to go back to your hell. You've heard me say this, haven't you, in different ways. Sir, madam, you've heard the truth tonight. Now you go out and make your choice whether you're coming back to hear more or whether you're going to start lying and criticizing and behaving like an animal and go back to your hell. You have to make, make your choice. Do you know, and you do know, that as clearly and as definitely and as pointedly and directly you say that to a person, they don't hear, right? They don't hear, they don't hear. The evidence they don't hear is that they go out and that's the last you see of them. Every once in a while a person will come here for a while and disappear and come back again. And I was discussing this with another member of the group here and the point was made Ah, here, he or she comes back again. Well, the pain has got too bad again. So they've come back. And they'll disappear again probably when they get the raise or get the woman or get the man. Think thoroughly about how totally and utterly confused and miserable we are. Right now, right this second, all of us in this room. Think about that. That's good thinking. That's realistic thinking. And then I give you the statement of fact, which you don't know is a fact, but which I give you on the intellectual level, that there is a way out. That the whole, the whole dungeon can be blasted and you can get out of it if you want it, if the pain is bad enough. If you're happy, there's no hope for you until you get miserable. Once you're miserable, there's hope for you. Once you have run out of places to turn to, there's hope for you, right hope. about also not explaining yourself to yourself, which is commonly called self-justification. Well, the reason I wrote that, that hot note, that nasty note to that business company or to that person or to that relative, the reason I wrote that hot note is because they deserved it for the way they treated me. You're explaining your evil, are you not? How about not doing that anymore and simply see the fact that you wrote that hot note or made that hot remark because you're a machine that can't do anything else. The only thing a volcano can give, being a mechanical thing, is hot lava. If we're mechanical, that's the only thing we can give is hot lava. 
burning ourselves and therefore everything else out there, the two burnings being one. How about not justifying our behavior or praising it anymore, <laughs> but simply seeing it, trying to understand it, so that we can be detached from it and be something other than that, than it. If I justify it, then I am still part of it. I'm trying to keep it in place. It's about time I told him off. You'll have to tell someone off, else off later. Never excuse bad behavior of any kind. Instead, study it to see why you have been unnecessarily captured by it. Unnecessarily captured by it. What a relief, and then we'll have a break. What a relief to be free of false virtues, of imaginary virtues, of uh, artificial virtues, compelled to live up the image of being a good wife, a good husband. Oh, if I just could break away from this and not be so good, but I have to be. What will happen to me if I, I stay in this situation or if I get out of the situation? There is an answer to every problem you have. There's an answer to every question you have, to every difficulty, to every sorrow, to every pain. There is an answer. The answer is found in the hard and persistent work that we're doing in this class. And in brief, the answer is found in putting an end to the person who tries to solve the problem putting an end to the person who asks the frantic question so that there's no, nothing there that asks the question or tries to solve the problem, which is freedom, which is God, which is truth, which is the kingdom within, which is attainable if you want it. And wanting it means to go against yourself your old nature from this day forward. And after a while, you will change inwardly. You will know it. You will feel it. You will behave differently. You will be different. And that's all you need. All you need in this world is to be a different kind of a person than you now are. That's all I need. That's all I need. The other things take care of themselves, finding employment to make money and all that. That takes care of themselves much better, by the way, because my wholeness and your wholeness is intelligent toward the sickness of this world. Knows how to handle it. Knows how to handle it because it's free of it and not a part of it. We could do a lot better things with it here in this room. Did I see? Yes, Zena. Vernon, you mentioned something about, uh, like, each student will eventually have to become active in teaching this. Mm -hmm. Would it be a natural swing to the activity of teaching? Um, you know, I <laughs> don't want to go out and, you know, you don't solicit, but you would know in talking to someone, it would just be very natural to share the class. Or Confine it to this class for now. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, you could get into a lot of trouble. <laughs> yeah. Every beginner goes out and preaches the <laughs> gospel of esotericism and, and then gets very confused. I thought they were going to love it like I loved it. You don't even love it yourself. You're using it. Where did I see a wait, wobbly hand, I think? I see a wobbly hand. Go ahead. <laughs> okay. Is confusion always an attempt of the ego to solidify itself, or is there, or can confusion be a simple incapacity? Okay, it's connected with it. Look, look. 
You know what egotism always says, and this is very easy, we can all look at ourselves and, and understand this. Egotism says, I know. I know what is right. Every teenager on the face of this earth knows what is right, right? How many of you were ever teenagers? How many of you were sorry you were? All right. Egotism always... That was late, Dylan. Egotism insists it knows what is right. And have you ever noticed how this insistence, insistence is connected with confusion? Say yes, Rod. Yes, Rod. Oh, okay. <laughs> What if I could drop the insistence that I was right, or, as a beginner, study why I must insist that I'm right? Why I have to try to convince you and argue with you and about anything, about anything, about politics. And why do I have to convince you that I'm right? Because I have an eye connected with it. But that is confusion. The false self is confusion, and it'll flip-flop where the best reward comes, back and forth. <laughs> Egotism is confusion, because, if we've discovered here in this class, we're not just one person, we're, we're 50 people. Have you ever notice yourself in an argument with someone and you are right about something and man they really got a hot point and for a minute you're doubtful yeah. huh now you're two people right already and maybe next week you'll be convinced to a third alternative we're trying to be one person one person which has no name no name at all no physical description at all, obviously on the physical level, but we're not identified with the physical description, we're not identified with the past or with the future. We're one person free now. If you're confused, you're simply identified with the past. You don't know who you are. Remember, you used to be successful, now you're a flop or vice versa, or whatever. Are you that dummy who got mixed up years ago in this situation? Now you're wondering how to get out of it? The dummy did get mixed up, and only a real understanding of these things can get you out so that you don't form another dumb situation. Trying to get out of the squirrel cage, going around the same circle all the time. Can be done. Okay. Uh, if you can take shocks, I'm not going to give you one in particular. If you can take the shocks, this is what we always come to, then you can begin to wake up. The little shock of getting up here and giving a talk taking the active role for once and one look in the you're up here for one minute on Sunday for one minute out of how many minutes what's three times an hour and a half let's say six hours six hours uh, five hours and 59 minutes you're you're passive one a minute you're active some of you won't even be active for one minute How about asking a question? You can, if you don't want to ask a question, but think of you know, make the thing sensible. Ask, force yourself to ask a question, and watch yourself get shaky. That's what it's all about. That's the active role. It's going to shake you just to ask a question, because you someone's looking around, or maybe it's a dumb question, or are you even scared of the sound of your own voice because you're dimly conscious of it. Or what if he balls me out because I've heard him ball other people out and say that was a stupid question. I don't want to be called stupid in front of these people. My wife is sitting right next to me for one thing, and she thinks I'm great. And so we remain in prison.
Yes, Juan. You said a little while ago about having unconscious idols. Right. Is it possible that I have an odd thing I do, unconscious idols that I'm not aware of? Of course you do. And I am one of them, Juan. Right? right? Which is why you hate me at times. <laughs> you bought me out. Yeah, Juan and I are old friends. We can talk this way. That's right. I, I watch Juan all the time. I watch all of you for that matter. Juan is much too polite toward me. You ever seen that, Juan? You're much too polite to me. Which doesn't mean you should be unpolite. Be polite to me. <laughs> there. I might vaguely uh, be beginning to see that I idolize my own fare. I set it up as a as a goal, as an idol. Well, let's say you're in love with it. Yes, you're in love with it. You maintain it, do you not? Yes, right. Don't you understand that if you love it, you will maintain it? You cease to love it, you won't maintain it? You cease to love your misery, it'll start to fade out. I said, if you cease to love your misery, which you all have, it would begin to fade out. But you love it, this is you. This is the only you you've got. Hang on to it. Sally. Can you be overactive? For instance, what about the people who like attention and you hear in class, let's say, uh, could you comment on that? Uh, say that again. I. Okay, you're saying that the audience is pa passive, which is right, Yes. to the teacher. Now, what about the people in class uh, who are mechanically active. And mechanically active. Yes, yes. And any opportunity will speak. Yeah. Regardless. Yes, Larry is a good example of that. Larry is mechanically active. And he should work, the rest of you should work on being more active. Larry has to work at being less mechanically active. He raises his hand more than anyone in this class. Right? So that's where he has to work. Ask a question, Larry. Uh, yes, I do. If maybe a little later, would you talk a little more about instant recovery? Instant recovery is a great shock to your system. It's the last thing you want to do. Instant recovery simply means this. You're going along. Let's see if I can get a good example. Ah. You're going along, long, oh, let me ask, how many of you are envious, jealous, any way at all? Come on. Of anyone else, anyone else in the world, jealous, any, for any reason, all right. That was, yeah, I, <laughs> you catch yourself being envious of another person, let's say, for any reason at all. Instant recovery could become possible. That is, you see, that's a bad state, a wrong state. What is instant recovery? Instant recovery becomes possible the minute you see that there is no you here to be jealous of another person who is as equally non-existent as you are. See, we're jealous because we imagine that this self, this person, must have the same thing or, or something better that the other person has. See, don't you understand that that this is this is not the real you thinking at all, but a mechanical motion which you have identified with and said, I wish I was as rich as he is. The lady says, I wish I was as young and pretty as she is, which involves so many wrong things we'd be here all night talking about. It involves time, it involves identification with, with the physical body involves the fact that you feel cheated by life, that you're not as young as pretty as that other person. 
Instant recovery means to see right now that there's no one here who has, who has to be jealous of anyone else because personally you're not there and neither are they. But imagination through identification arouses jealousy. I wish I had that so I could confirm that I am great or I am young so you will look at me because I don't know who I am but if I had that you will look at me and say I'm pretty or I'm rich then then I can deceive myself into thinking that I exist so jealousy serves our false sense of existence die to jealousy and watch the pain it gives you because you're not there anymore competition ego competition Can you imagine truth being envious of anyone? But we're, we're human yet. We're human yet. Find some area where you have a particular, particularly strong envy of someone else. You look around at someone, maybe someone in this room for that matter, anyone that you're envious of for any reason at all, and you go to work on that. And the resistance, the fight that that envy will give you will be, the crash will be heard from here to Los Angeles when you crash and try to get rid of that. It doesn't want to give you up. And you don't want to give it up. You, you're allied on the side of your own envy because this is you. You are your envy. This is all you've got. Love it. Cherish it. And suffer And envy will trick you into saying, listen, this, you listen very carefully to this. Envy will trick you into thinking that it's fearful to give it up, that it's frightening, that you'd better cling to it. There's a great gap of darkness out there, which is non-envy. And if you take the leap into that non-envy, it, it's frightening. So you, you stay here. This is a lie, too. See the lie that envy has said? If you drop me, you will be nothing. Who would you be? Do it. Call the bluff. Call the hoax on envy and watch what happens. You'll be stronger than you were before. You'll be more in command than you were before. You'll be the relief. The relief you'll experience is indescribable. But you will feel it. You will know it. Thank God I'm not suffering from that. I didn't even know I was suffering. I didn't know I was jealous of him. Now I see it because I studied it. Thank heaven I'm relieved of that. Now on to the next one. In trying to see my own thoughts and actions, and one of the reasons that I'm not active as a student has many labels. My fear of being found out. Correct. Uh, not wanting to say anything unless it's safe. Yeah. And right. Then, if we see we're in love with our own suffering, it seems to be too much to give up all the suffering at once. We have to work on it in these individual areas. Try like to get try, sure. Like it would be proper use of your mind, Dorothy, and the rest of us, to find some particular, to isolate, proper use of the mechanical part of the mind even, to find some little isolated, to isolate it mm -hmm. as a, a proper mental technique, to isolate it and say, I was what in that situation? I suffered in that situation because I was afraid of offending that person. Why was I afraid of offending that person? Well, he's the man who gives me my paycheck, he's the, the woman who gives me sex, whatever. Which does not mean you offend someone, but you see what a terrible thing you're doing to yourself. You see what a terrible thing you're doing to yourself all day long and cease to love that. No, no more. 
get rightly militant 